let's, uh, let's pray today. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we get to hear from your word. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would move to convict us of your word and that you would be with us this morning. We truly need you, God, to be here with us. We thank you, knowing that you do hear us, Lord. Amen. In September, we here at Seven Mile Road will be celebrating our 13th anniversary as a church plant here in Philadelphia. It's amazing to think that it's already been 13 years. And I think if you were to travel back in time and talk to a younger version of Pastor Ajay and ask him if he thought that the church would make it to 13 years, I think that he would have a real hard time answering positively. You know, just because the unfortunate truth is that about 80% of church plants fail within just their very first couple of years. You know, but I think if you were to change the question to a J in that moment and ask him, what will it take for this church to get to 13 years or, and beyond? I think he would say that in order to get to 13 years and more, God will have to be with us and that he will have to be active and at work every step of the way. And church, I think that we've actually seen real evidences of this in the life of the church. In the, in the beginning, when the, the church that was previously here, St. Mark's, when they were looking to sell their building and, uh, and the property of, that had this building, instead of accepting multi-million dollar offers, they turned all of those down and sold it to our church for just one dollar. I think we've seen it through the years as well as God has continued to bring different people from different uh, areas of the city, different ethnicities under one roof to praise God together and to try to live life together according to his word. And lastly, I think that we see God at work in the life of this church every single day that we get to keep our doors open and continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, and this theme of God being at work in the life of the church is, is really important for us today. It's really important for us to grasp this because we, are t we today are going to be looking at another church plant, this one in the city of Philippi. And we're going to look at this because in, in a few short weeks, we're actually going to do a whole sermon studies on the book of Philippians. So to better help us uh, understand and, and give us some context around that book, we want to look at the beginnings of this church in Philippi. And what we will see is that God was at work in the very foundation of this church. And the result of that work is so great that the city of Philippi is never the same. So for the next half hour or so, please uh, bear with me as we're going to see God at work in Philippi. And hopefully this text will better help us understand our main idea for today. Our, our big idea, our main idea is that the God who is at Philippi who's at work in Philippi, is still at work today. Catch this again. That the God who is at work in Philippi is still at work today. And in this chapter, we're going to see God at work in three different types of people. And the, these types of people are not unique. These are people that we actually see every day, even today. So as we go through this text, we're going to see God at work saving these people. And it's going to be bulleted as that God saves everyday people, God saves those who are marginalized, and God saves those who are desperate. So if you have your Bibles, you can keep them open to Acts chapter 16. We're going to go through these, all these verses that Ryan read for us, and we'll highlight a few of these key verses. So in Acts chapter 16, we, have, we are met with these two men by the name of Paul and Silas. Paul was someone who was previously persecuting followers of Jesus Christ, someone who was previously hunting them down and killing them, now has had an encounter with Jesus himself, and he is radically transformed and now is one of Christianity's biggest advocates. And we see in verse 11 that they're going through these cities, making their way to Philippi, and they reach the city of Philippi. And for, for context, Philippi is, is a city in, in Europe. 
It was a city that was under the rule of Rome, and it's described as a leading city in Macedonia. You know, I, I like to compare Philippi to actually like a modern day Philadelphia, right? Because we would all describe Philadelphia as a leading city, right? You know, right above those other minor cities like New York and Boston and LA. Philly's like leading, it's up there, right? So think of uh, Philippi as a modern day Philly. It's a popular area, it has businesses, it has commerce, it has places of worship. And you know, when Paul gets to Philippi, see his strategy in these cities were to actually go into the synagogues and preach first to the Jewish community. And then after that, he would go out and preach to the Gentiles, anyone who wasn't Jewish. But we see here that Paul actually goes outside of the city gate. And that's because in Philippi, there was no synagogue. So by the river, there was this place of prayer where anyone who was of, of Jewish tradition would go there to congregate and pray and hear about God. So Paul goes there, and what he finds is this group of women praying. And it is here at this place of prayer along the river, among these women, where we will see God at work and saving everyday people. See, because the text focuses in on a woman named Lydia. And Lydia, there's a couple things we actually learn about her, right? We learn that she's from a, a city called Thyatira, which is a, a city in Asia. We learn that she is a seller of purple goods. Uh, purple goods were very expensive in that time. Purple was a sign of wealth and royalty. So it's reasonable to believe that Lydia herself was actually wealthy and uh, pretty successful as a businesswoman. And lastly, we know that she is a worshiper of God. See, in her city, uh, her hometown of Thyatira, there was a synagogue there, actually. And it's most likely there where she learned about God, heard about uh, all of his commandments and all that, he all that he has done. So she was familiar with Old Testament and, and all that. But for, for our purposes, Lydia is just an everyday person. And she's an average person. She, she has a job. She goes to work. She tries to be pious. She tries to do good. She tries to follow rules and live by some sort of moral code. She's just like any one of us or anyone that we would encounter out in the world. But something amazing is about to happen here in verse 14, where the, Lydia's life is about to be radically changed. Take a look at verse 14 with me. And after we get through this description of Lydia, it says that the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. See, God is at work here through the Holy Spirit is actually capturing Lydia's attention and opening her heart to listen to what Paul's about to say. And we don't know exactly what, what Paul says because the text just doesn't give that information, but I have to try to put myself in that situation. And, you know, I think that Paul maybe would have started going through the Old Testament, right? Something that Lydia was familiar with from her hometown. And maybe he started walking through there and say how, I hey, remember Israel? And remember how they had many different priests in Israel? And how none of them were sinless or blameless? How they actually fell uh, multiple times and how they couldn't go before God directly because of their sin? And maybe they, he, she fast forward a little bit and talked about the kings of Israel and how all the kings of Israel, were, were, they had some pretty great kings, right? But all those kings eventually died and all of their kingdoms eventually were destroyed. And lastly, maybe he started talking about the prophets of the Old Testament, right? But even those men were, were, were flawed, and they depended on God for all of their uh, visions and interpretations and prophecies. They, they depended on God for that. See, but as Paul is going through this, I think what he's underlining here is Israel's actual need for a better prophet and a better priest and a better king than Israel had ever had. And it is here where I think that Paul starts to tell Lydia about Jesus. And he talks to tell her that he was more than just a man, that he was actually God, that he was the son of God, that he was actually a king. 
And he came to this earth to establish a kingdom that would never be destroyed, that would never be shaken. And then that he's the king of kings and lord of lords. And then start talking about how Jesus is also the better, a better priest. How he was blameless and sinless and never fell. But rather, he actually goes before the Father directly to intercede for his people, to pray for his people. So that his people would not be separated from God, but rather be brought near to God. And lastly, he's talked about how he was the perfect prophet. Because when he came here, he said that he came to die as the once and for all sacrifice for sins. But he prophesied that he would not stay dead, but that he would actually rise from the dead. And here, I imagine he's zoning in on Lydia and saying, Lydia, it, it, we know this to be true because he actually did it. He actually rose from the dead and he actually lives today. He's saying, Lydia, if you would just believe and put your trust in Jesus, he will be your righteous king your perfect priest and perfect sacrifice so that your sins would be forgiven, so that you would no longer be separate from God, but you would be brought into uh, to God's family and be called a child of God. And, and I think what's key here is that while Paul is speaking this to Lydia, God is at work in her heart. God is opening her heart and ears and eyes to really listen and see what Paul is saying and not just to hear it, but to believe it and trust in it. And can I say that if you are a fellow believer of Jesus Christ, this experience that Lydia is having is not unique to her. No, no, no. That same spirit that was in Lydia at work was at work in your life the moment that you, your eyes were opened, that you really saw who Jesus was, that, you just, that moment when you decided to put your trust in Jesus Christ. Christ. This is that same spirit, because God, who was at work in that moment, was still at work today. And it is with that same spirit that we must pray, that we must pray, church, that God would continue to open hearts. Listen, if you want your children to follow Christ, we need to pray, God, would you open the hearts of my children? If you want your family members to know Jesus, we need to pray, God, would you open the heart of my family members? If you want your friends or coworkers, God, please open the heart of my friends and my coworkers so that they would see who you are and what you have done. Take a moment this, right now to think about who is that Lydia in your life that you can be praying for, for God to come and open their hearts. See, because the God who was at work in Philippi is still at work today, and he still opens hearts. So we should pray that God would give us opportunities to share the gospel so that he can continue to do the work of opening hearts. Because when God does that work, when God does the heart work, that person is changed, and they are never the same. See, because when God works in Lydia we see that she comes to believe. And not, not just her, but her whole family. They come to believe and they're baptized. And Lydia becomes the very first person in all of Europe to believe and put her trust in Jesus. And as the Lord continues to work in Philippi, more will join, the number of believers will grow, and the word will continue to spread. And church, that is honestly the prayer of our church here that God would do that same work here in Philadelphia, that people would come, that they would hear, that God would open their hearts and believe so that they would put their trust in him and then continue to spread that gospel. And that, that cycle would just continue until this word reaches the whole city of Philadelphia and the city of Philadelphia would be changed radically for Jesus. That is our prayer here this morning. See, because... When God does that transformational work, we'll see what happens with Lydia. Because after Lydia's radical transformation, she is so grateful that she actually opens her doors, opens her home to Paul and his fellow missionaries to stay there and to continue to do this work in Philippi. And, and, that, and that small act of hospitality will allow 
this church in Philippi to actually establish its building in Lydia's house. There she will actually open her doors and all that she has so that more people can come and meet and gather and pray and, and hear the gospel so that God could continue to build his church in Philippi with other everyday people. In the next couple of verses, we see that God is not only building this church with seemingly everyday people. No, we will see that God is at work saving also those who are marginalized. As Paul and his fellow missionaries continue to go back and forth to this place of prayer, one day he has an encounter with a slave girl. And this slave girl is, ha- is described as having a spirit of divination. Pr- pretty much what that means is that she was possessed by a demon. And her owners would exploit her condition and rent her out and use her to do fortune tellings. You know, because in that time, kings would actually consult these fortune tellers before doing anything, before going to war or before passing a public policy, because they thought that way they can have some insight in how successful they might be. Ultimately, it was a scam and a way for owners of these slaves to kind of get rich quick and exploit these unfortunate uh, people. But let's see in verses 17 and 18 what happens when God steps in and when God is at work in this girl. It says that she followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And and it came out that very hour. See, God at work in this slave girl is to set her free from this demon that possessed her. This little girl who probably spent her whole life in shackles, bound up, being exploited because of her condition, is now in this moment experiencing freedom for the very first time. See, God in Philippi is not only concerned about those who are seemingly religious, like Lydia, or those who are successful. No, he he is in Philippi saving those who are marginalized and those who are exploited by society. And God still today, church, saves those who are, who are marginalized. He cares for those who are hurting. He cares for those who are treated poorly. He cares for those who, by society standards, should not be cared for. And he radically changes their lives. He, he shows them love. And he calls them precious. And he deems them worthy and covers them with the blood of Jesus Christ. And while this girl is being set free and her life being changed, what is highlighted in these next couple of verses isn't actually what happens next with the little girl, but rather how her owners respond to that transformation. See, they are furious. Because in, in a blink of an eye, their way of life is changed. Their way of life was being challenged. And they can... Uh, no longer exploit this little girl for money. And they were so angry that they actually grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them to the center of town, the marketplace, and in front of all the town and the town's rulers, start accusing them of breaking some law to hopefully punish them. And before Paul and Silas could, could, could offer any sort of rebuttal or any sort of defense, we'll see what happens in verses 22 through 24 Uh, what happens to them. It says that the crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. See, brothers and sisters, the radical change of this little girl changed the town's relationship with not only her, but with those who were bringing this message of Jesus. And let me say that for some of you, 
experiencing this life-giving and uh, radical transformation of following Jesus means that some of your previous relationships will change as well. It means that when you decide to live for Christ and not for yourself, people will notice. And they might not like what they see. And, and the truth is that that could even cost you relationships. It could cost you your status in society. Because following Christ means following his word and standing for what it says, even when society says something else. I mean, come on, we, we see this every single day. Society deems something good and, and, and for you to follow your heart and all of your desires, right? But then God's word on the, on the flip side calls those desires sinful, and that we should run from them, and that we should run towards Jesus. And there's that, that tension there, right, between society and God's word. And society actually hates God's word for that. And when you stand for God's word and you follow Jesus Christ, you, you get caught in that tension. And that could lead you to face uh, the crossfire it could lead you to face ridicule and name-calling or even exclusion from groups or even loss of friendships. But Christian, take heart because God promises that you are not alone in this, but rather that you are blessed and that your reward is in heaven. Because if you would just give up your treasures here on earth, whether it be physical, like monetary things or, or, or social status, relationships-wise, if you would give that up and cling to Jesus, you gain something far more valuable. And that is a relationship with the one true living God, who, unlike society, his standards never change. And his love for you never changes. And his grace towards you never changes. And that is your assurance this morning. But you see, these slave owners wanted nothing to do with that, that, that news, that gospel. And all they see is that Paul and Silas have pretty much ruined their, their income at the moment. And in their anger and hatred, they lie about Paul and Silas and beat them and throw them in prison. And at this point, I don't know about you, but you, I would think that Paul and Silas would just, just give up in Philippi. right? Forget Philippi. They don't want to hear this. We're, we'll, we're, we're, we're leaving. But we see that that is not how they are. They aren't uh, tired or afraid or worn down. We see that in verse 25, that actually when they are in prison, they are singing hymns and praying to God and praising God in the midst of their uh, persecution. What, what you and I, church, were just doing at the very beginning of this service, praying to God, lifting up our hands in, in worship and praise to God, they were doing it, but after their arms were beaten and after their mouths were bloodied, they were still trusting in Jesus. And church, we can learn so much from this one verse about trusting in God in our times of trouble. Now, I won't get into it too much because that is the pretty much huge theme across all of Philippians. Um, but brothers and sisters, if today you currently find yourself in a situation like Paul, in a situation where you don't see any way out or a tough circumstance, or maybe you just feel alone in the moment, take heart. Endure through this season. Know that God has not left you. To you, God might feel far, but if you are his, he has you in his hands, and he is near to you, and not a single moment will go by that he is not ordained and is in control of. See, Paul and Silas are wonderful examples in how we should respond during times of trouble, and that is to continue to praise God, knowing that he is still at work. Because God, in all his sovereignty, may just be using your suffering, your situation, to reach someone in your life who is maybe even more desperate. Because as we are about to see, God is also saving. 
those who are desperate. See, as Paul and Silas are singing and praising God and the other prisoners are listening, God is about to show up again in Philippi and capture this time the attention of this jailer. See, uh, suddenly an earthquake hits. And it's so violent that it, it's a, verse 26 says that it, the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. You know, and, and that jailer who was supposed to, to guard these men and keep them locked up, he, he's literally shaken up and he wakes up from his sleep. And, sa- and it says that as he saw that the prison doors were open and he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. See, the jailer thought that seeing all these doors open must have surely meant that uh, the prisoners fled at the first chance they got, that they tried to escape any, any further harm. And he knew that he would be the one held responsible for it. Because, right, like, who would believe this jailer? Yeah, you know, uh, an earthquake hit last night. You didn't feel it? And the doors just got opened, and then they all left, right? That's highly unlikely. So uh, instead of, uh, you know, waiting for these rulers to come and hold him accountable and try to kill him, he decides to take his life into his own hands and tries to take his own life. See, this was the, is probably the peak of desperation. But just as he is about to kill himself, Paul, from inside the jail cell, inside the jail cell, yells out, "Do not harm yourself, for we are all here." See, the purpose of God's miracle in opening these jail cell doors was not so that Paul and Silas could go free. And we know this because at the end of this, uh, at the end of the night, they're still cap- they're still prisoners. So that wasn't the point of God's miracle. See, they they had not escaped any persecution or trial in the moment. Something much greater was at stake here than just the momentary freedom for Paul and Silas. What was at stake here was the life of the jailer. See, God working in Philippi in this moment is to literally shake up the jailer and capture his attention. Much like how God worked in the heart of Lydia, to grab her attention, God worked in this moment so that the jailer and his family could hear about Jesus and be saved not from a physical death, but rather an eternal death. And we see that God was was extremely successful in capturing this jailer's attention because in verse 29 and 30, we see that it says that when he hears Paul, the jailer called for the lights. And rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And and church, that is the key question of today, isn't it? What must I do to be saved? It's been the key question through the centuries, and what must essentially be asked by anyone who comes to faith. It's a question that really comes from God already being at work in the heart of the individual. And this morning, if you find yourself like Lydia, as someone who knows about God, but doesn't really know God and have their full trust in Jesus Christ, or maybe you're like the jailer, and you're at the end of your rope, and you find yourself asking yourself this question, can I tell you that God is already at work in your heart. God is already at work in your heart. It's, and maybe God, through means of some miracle, maybe it wasn't an earthquake, but maybe through means of some miracle, he brought you here this morning to hear. And I don't know what he did to grab your attention this morning, but if you're asking yourself, what must I do to be saved? The answer can be found here in Paul and Silas's response. Where in verse 31 it says, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And see, what's the, what's, what does that mean? What's the, how do we do that practically? What does it mean to believe in Jesus? 
very simply and, and, and very quickly, uh, abbreviated version, it's to mean that you're a sinner in need of a savior because your sin separates you from God. It separates you from God. And in order to rectify that relationship, you need a perfect sacrifice. And we, me or you, could not provide that sacrifice ourselves. But the good news of the gospel is that where you and I could not provide that sacrifice, God provided a savior in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And you must run to Christ and put your trust in him and trust and believe that God, uh, his son Jesus, came down from heaven and put on flesh. And as fully God and fully man, lived a perfect life and died as a living sacrifice so that your sins would be forgiven, so that you would no longer be far from God or separate from God or an enemy of God, but now you are brought into his family. You are brought near to him. And now you are called a child of God. And as children of God, you inherit an eternal life. All of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and a real salvation. And you don't have to understand every aspect of what I just said perfectly. You don't have to have the perfect theology or set of words to understand or to, to come and believe in Jesus. But above all, what you must do this morning is put your trust in the life and work of Jesus Christ. If you have not previously accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this call is for you to believe in him, to put your trust in him, to have him as your Lord and Savior. If you feel that God is doing this work in your heart this morning, right now, calling you to believe and accept this good news, I invite you to come talk with myself or one of the pastors after the service. See, because for those of you guys who are, are maybe new to faith or maybe you're coming to the, for the first time, the origin of this Philippian church is much like the origin story of every believer. See, it, it's one marked out by trials, persecution, rejection, but it's also marked by an amazing grace, an unconditional love, and a powerful movement of God in the heart and life of all who would put their trust in him. See, but the point of looking to the beginning, looking to the origin or the foundation of this church is not just to, to stay there and, and to, to just look at that, but it's to take that and actually look ahead in time to see where this story is going. See, Paul and Silas, after, be, after being tended to by the jailer and after, uh, after them having baptized their whole family and rejoicing with them that night, the next day they're eventually released. And they get a, a simple apology from the rulers and they're kindly asked to leave or maybe more so forcefully asked to leave, right? But before they do leave, they go back to Lydia's house, to this new church building where this church plant is starting up. And at this point, uh, the church has started to grow. At the bare minimum, you have Lydia and her family, you have the jailer and his family, and quite possibly you even have the, the slave girl herself. And this little church plant sees Paul and Silas coming, and they just go and encourage them. They encourage them, and I imagine they, you know, uh, equip them and give them anything they might need to continue on their journey. And when Paul and Silas leave Philippi, this isn't the end for this Philippian church. Now, what we'll see in the book of Philippians coming up is that this church will continue to be a great encouragement for Paul. They'll continue to be a great support, sending him whatever he might need for him to continue his journey and, and spreading this gospel. And what we also learn in Philippians is that they don't just send uh, uh, support, but they're actually faithful in their, and where they're at in Philippi. They continue to preach the gospel. They continue to, to talk to people, and God continues to do the work of opening hearts. And where this story is headed 
is that this gospel continues to just permeate and spread through all of Philippi, continue to just permeate and spread through Rome and its huge empire to the point where Rome eventually trades its pantheon of gods for the one true living God. And this word continues to, to spread and permeate through all of Europe to the point where uh, many years back it eventually gets brought here to America. And here God continued to be at work in the lives of so many faithful brothers and sisters all the way up to 13 years ago where God continued to work to move and plant this church. And 13 years later, God continues to move and be at work today. Not just here, but all over Philadelphia, all over Pennsylvania, and all over the world. God continues to work, and he continues to save everyday people, continues to care for and save those who are marginalized, and continues to save those who are desperate. Church, let us pray this morning that God would continue to allow us to do this work so that more people would hear, more hearts would be open, and more would come to put their trust in Jesus. Let's pray that he would do this until the day that he returns. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful for your word this morning. We pray that we would be convinced that you are still at work and active today, Lord, just as you were in Philippi. And not just here in Seven Mile Road, but in Philly and all across the world. God, if there is anyone this morning who has not already put their trust in you, but find themselves feeling the draw of your spirit, Lord, we pray that you would continue to open their heart and that you would call them to repent and put their trust in your son. Lastly, God, we pray that we would stand firm in your word, that we would not be swayed by society, but truly count it as a blessing every chance we get to proclaim your gospel. We trust, God, we trust you, God, that you are continuing to do the life-changing work of saving everyday people, those who are marginalized and those who are desperate, Lord. We thank you, God, and love you, and pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.